Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of fantasy romance and romantic fantasy. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. I did a little bit less half and half today. Still works. Today is Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> How are you guys? Um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm uh, clicking along here. I I got up to do something. I paused because I didn't want to forget to do it. Um, went out for drinks last night with some fun writer people. Uh, Leslie Robin, who is in town, editor at Galaxy's Edge. <coughs> um, <laughs> it ended up being a funny evening, but I'll, I'll tell you the ending of the evening I think is funny. But uh, she was there and Emily Ma, Emily Ma Tippets, and, um, <laughs> and then Twig. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, Tick Delusia. Yeah. Uh, Twig is the manager at Beasley Bookstore and then also uh, Jim Sorensen and Jack who writes his um, J.M. Barton. He, he does the podcast. I interviewed him on here. Anyway, so it was six of us and we had this great table by the fire at Rio Chama, which is one of my favorite bars. And it was a um, terrific conversation. Very funny evening. We sat there a long time. Um, like three hours, I think. So, so that was, that was awesome. It was really fun. And so, and I gave Leslie a ride because she is blind. She has like 10, 15% of her sight and cannot drive. So, and she's staying at George R. R. Martin's house, uh, in one of his casitas. He has kind of like a walled compound deal. And so when I picked her up, she was waiting at the gate for me uh, and had just newly discovered freedom because there's a, um, you know, a lot of times the way that these gates work on these walled places, for those of you who do not live in a walled compound, uh, there's a sensor. So when you pull up in your car to the sensor, it automatically opens the gate. But she had discovered that a human being was not big enough to <laughs> trigger this sensor. So she was like, there has to be a way for a person on foot to do this. Right. And, and she was, she's funny. And, and we were just cracking up about it. Cause I was like, were you like dancing around in front of the sensor trying to look big, like a car? And she's like, I was, <laughs> you laugh, but I was. So anyway, she found out the trick, uh, which is surprising. And I won't say it on the podcast, but, uh, so she was like, no, I'm free. I can leave the compound whenever I want to. So she, you know, triggered the gate and opened it and came out. So then I dropped her off again at like 8.30 or something. And it's cold. It's been cold here the last couple of weeks. Uh, really the coldest we've been all winter and snowy. Um, it's Santa Fe. And so we um, were a you know, dark compliance, dark sky city. So, you know, not many street lights. So it's pretty dark. So I take her to the gate and I said, um, do you know how to get back in? Do you have a code? And she said, no, but I'll just text George and, and he'll let me in. So she texts George and George does not reply because he had some other guests come in and she's like, you know, he probably has his phone like, and it's just sitting off to the side. And I said, I know, I know. So then she tries George's assistant, but it's her day off. One of George's assistants, it's her day off. So she's not picking up the phone. And so then I call one of our other mutual friends and ask if she knows, because I know she's been to George's house a number of times. And I said, do you know the gate code? And she said, no. <laughs> so I call Melinda Snodgrass, who's like George's best friend. And I was like, do you know the code? You know? And she's like, oh, are you out with Leslie? I said, yes. And I'm trying to take her back, but we're trapped outside. And, and Melinda's like, I don't. She said, every time I've gone there, it's been open for me. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, good for you. So finally, Leslie gets through to one of George's other assistants who gives her the code. Uh, 
quotes. It was just funny. Um, quite the quite the shenanigans. And then Leslie said, um, she said, well, I, I could just walk from here. And I'm like, don't be silly. I'll drive you the rest of the way in, which was good. I did because it's like you go off around and behind the big house and then down and you know, like there's a number of little casitas and stuff. And she's like in the very last one. I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> definitely dropping you off. So, um, it was just an entertaining evening. I may have had a little too much wine. As my mother says, I was overserved. Uh, but not that much. I mean, I was, I was fine to drive obviously, but, uh, feeling a little rough this morning, but, uh, progress on green magic is going well. I've got, um, I got through 70 pages yesterday. Oh, I guess I should say I went back to the beginning and, and, uh, long time listeners will recognize this pattern in me. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that I hit about 87, almost 88,000 words on the book. Well, that's after yesterday, but anyway, I'm at 87, 8, 28. Uh, it's probably going to be somewhere around 106 to 109,000 words. So I've still got 20,000 words to go. Um, not that I'm concerned. <laughs> so I decided definitely go back to the beginning yesterday and begin my revising. And so, and I made it to 70 pages, 70 of 322. So, and it was pretty solid. Um, you could tell by my speed that that was, um, yeah, I didn't have to do a lot. I ended up adding, well, let's just see here. I added 543 words and deleted 52. <laughs> That's not too bad. I don't cut everything I delete, but if I cut, like if I remember, I put it into an outtakes document just so I can kind of keep track of how much I'm deleting. So we'll see. I, I do feel like I'm getting a better fix on the arc and remembering things. So I would like have my little notes of things that I have to remember to wind up for the end, which was good because I was concerned I was forgetting some things and it's giving me ideas on winding it up. Not that I didn't have plenty, but it's always good to kind of know what I'm doing. <laughs> so other things. Um, so I've been reading a lot. Well, I read a lot all the time, but I've been reading uh, Thorn by Intasar Kanani. Hope I'm saying the name right. And uh, Grace had told me a long time ago to read it and I bought it a long time ago and, you know, languished on my Kindle as books are wont to do. And oh my God, you guys, it's so good. It is just so good. So it's a goose girl retelling. And some of you may know that I did a goose girl retelling uh, Heart's Blood. And so it's fascinating to me to see the ways that Intasar and I both use the same story elements in similar ways. Only she's like so much clever. I think she did such a better job. <laughs> now I'm like insanely jealous that she did such a better job than I did. Uh, but of course mine's a novella. So I'm going to cling to that excuse that she did a full novel. And so hers is naturally richer and more complex than I, I really love how she solved the problem of, and I feel like this is not a spoiler, right? Because it's goose girl fairy tale, which has been out for a long time. Was it at the workshop on Saturday when I was teaching it, I was talking about meeting romance expectations and I said, um, you know, like for example, Romeo and Juliet is not a romance. It's a tragedy because the lovers die at the end and somebody went spoiler alert. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, that's like, what's, what's the rule of if it's been out for at least a hundred years, then you can spoil the ending. So I have to take a moment to be amused by that. <laughs> Spoiler. So anyway, spoiler alert on the goose girl. If you are not familiar with the fairy tale, it's one of my favorites. So the princess is traveling with a lady in waiting to 
meet her, this prince of a foreign kingdom to whom she is betrothed to go and marry him. And along the way, the lady in waiting forces the princess to trade places with her and masquerades as the princess goes and marries the prince and the real princess is forced to become a goose girl. And it was something that I struggled with. And it's interesting when you do fairy tale retellings. Um, and I was touching on this a few weeks ago, talking about the difference between, you know, like when do you do a, a retelling? When is it, you know, to what degree do you cleave to the source material? Because it can be, um, well, it can be challenging. And I, I think to the detriment of the story sometimes. If you cling too closely to the source material and you can't make it justify itself within the, I'm waving my hands in the air if you are not on video. <laughs> this I'm, I'm thinking of, the, to me, stories are like a globe. For some reason, I always come back to this idea of a globe. It's like this big bubble and it's full of all this stuff and like this shimmering surface. I don't know why that's my mental image of a book, but it, but it is for better or worse. Know what your process is on it. For me, that's what it looks like. You know, if you have read uh, Nora Roberts, Born in Fire, I really, I really love Born in Fire. It's one of my favorites of hers. There's a scene where Maggie gets drunk and passes out in the meadow, <laughs> as, as an Irish artist will do, and she's looking up at the moon, and then she creates that globe for uh, the guy who is like a Rourke prototype. I forget what his name is in the book. Anyway. That's, that's the story image for me, that, that globe that she makes. So if you can't, so, so your story has to have this internal integrity. It, it becomes its own thing, which is, I think, partly why I think of it like a bubble because it like, you know, like you blow it like a soap bubble. You, you keep breathing air and air into it and it grows bigger and bigger. And then eventually it detaches and it goes floating off which is why I talk about like books feel like they take a little piece of me once they detach. There's that little bit of essence goes off with it. That's why I think it's exhausting when you finally release a book because like that packet of energy that's inside the globe goes with it. Anyway, <laughs> I'm waxing philosophical today. At least it's not self excoriating. That's a joke for bonds of magic readers. I put in, I created a house name yesterday that I tickled me immensely. Some things I put in just because I think they're funny. You guys will have to see what you think. So, um, I keep losing my original th thread here. So when you're doing a retelling, if you are determined to cleave to certain story elements for the sake of cleaving to the source material, and it doesn't vibe with the internal integrity of your story, then it's a problem, right? So when I did my goose girl retelling, I struggled with justifying how did this lady in waiting overpower the princess and force her to change places? What does she have on her? What did she do to her? And I had it developmental edited at the time and the editor pushed me on it. And I, I don't, I don't think it worked very well. I don't like the way that she pushed me on it. Uh, I think what Intasar did is, is superior, far superior. Um, and I don't know why it didn't occur to me that part of it is magic. It's like, duh, why didn't I think of using magic? Because I'm not as smart as Intasar. I don't know. And I haven't ever met her, but if she listens to this, she'll probably be amused. But she also did a, I thought it was interesting that we did similar things with the character of the princess and why, and sort of her arc, what it takes for her to, to sort of overcome this problem. And, and it's interesting. A lot of our beats are the same. So, but I'm sure that comes from the source material. Anyway, it's a really good book. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see how she ends it. I'm excited to read it. 
One thing I did over the weekend because I had finished a book that I was doing a blurb for and so I kind of finished up my reading obligations and so that's why I was kind of going back through my my TBR the the uh, leaning tower of to be read books and trying to decide what was I going to read next and I briefly settled on Persuasion by Jane Austen because I had not read Persuasion ever and full caveat I have read Emma Pride and Prejudice Sense and Sensibility all more than once I have never read I'm looking at my bookshelf now I've never read Mansfield Park or Northanger Abbey though I have copies of them on my shelf and I had not read Persuasion and I bought it a while back for Kindle I think I don't have a paper copy of Persuasion and I know I had watched one of the I don't know how many there are but I had watched one of the um, movie versions of it with my friend Margaret and she had said that Persuasion was her favorite and I had bought the Kindle book some years ago when I was sort of casting about for something to read and I was looking for something of a particular style and a lot of people had said or someone had chimed in I, I feel like it was more than one saying oh well if you've never read Persuasion you have to so I started reading it and I was so bored and I wasn't liking it I mean and I kind of want <laughs> I was almost going to post on social media being like is this just me because then I went and looked up um, you know like to see if people said because I know that people feel like Mansfield Park and Northanger Abbey are not her best works but you know persuasion there were sort of waxing and it was like the Jane Austen Society or something so of course they're going to say nice things but they were saying that it was what that it's one of her most popular works which surprised me do we think that's true I mean what would be the empirical evidence for that well, none but I don't think it's <laughs> And they said oh well and then it's infused with this perspective of a more mature woman because it was her last book and I mean I I should resonate with that right um <laughs> so I got through I, I read to like 20 percent of persuasion and I was not having fun I, I for a while I thought well I just need to settle into the pace and the language you know it's different and um <laughs> like 20 percent I was like I do not care about this heroine I don't care about any of these people I'm really tired of reading about the silliness of the discussions around the children and so forth so I I bailed so is this just me what am I missing on persuasion uh, please let me know or even better let me know that's not just me because it's like I I'm so not getting it and I didn't love the movie either even though my friend was rhapsodizing over it and I was like okay well maybe it's because I haven't read the book you know because I do think especially with books like Jane Austen or um, Henry James some of these books from that era you you get a lot more out of the movie version if you've read the book and you have all of that nuance but I did um, discover a lovely quote when I was looking up is it just me that I'm not liking persuasion and this was something that her brother had said about her uh, he had said an invincible distrust of her own judgment induced her to withhold her works from the public till time and many perusals had satisfied her that the charm of recent composition was dissolved and I threw that up on social media um, but I love that because there's the charm of recent composition there really is something to that that like what you've just finished writing it's hard to see it clearly and when we talk about like the kill your darlings thing I think a lot of people don't understand that that's like only after some time and distance when you can step back and see things that you have put in there well like if you make up a house name just to amuse yourself but that's a tiny thing I get to keep that because at heart harms nothing but if your darling is for example cleaving to an element of the source material because you feel like it's important or you should then then that's something to evaluate once the charm of recent composition has dissolved 
So that's why it's interesting for me to go back and start revising from the beginning because um, it was interesting to read stuff that I started writing like back in November because it's taken me a while to write this book. And yeah, there is no charm of recent composition. In fact, there's like sometimes little recognition. It's like, oh, why did I put that in there? <laughs> so I thought that was good insight. So on that note, I'm going to get busy, uh, get my shit done, as, as they say. I hope that you all have a wonderful Tuesday. I hope that you are getting your own shit done uh, in a way that is pleasing to you and rewarding. And I will talk to you all on Thursday. You all take care. Bye-bye.